I want to thank Nurse Chelsea for joining me tonight and giving us explanations on cosmetic injections and devices such as Morpheus 8, Potenza, PicoSure, and IPL. Let's get going. See, I have known Chelsea since uh, 2019. Actually, I went to you first for temple fillers yes. and then I haven't gone anywhere else since. Can you give your background a little bit? I basically have a super passion for science, a degree in biology, and I continuously ping pong back and forth between the beauty world and the science world. And I never felt fully welcomed or at peace in either of them. And so fast forward, I, I did my biology degree and then I actually became a uh, management in cosmetics in two large retailers. I went from one to the other, like the two largest retailers of cosmetics in Canada at that time. This was actually pre-Sephora days, believe it or not. And then after that, I ended up uh, going back to university and uh, becoming a nurse. During that time, I needed some money. So I actually opened up a makeup business and it was called CB Mobile Makeup. I've never been able to stop being out of the beauty industry. Then I became a nurse and then I started working in the ER which brought me to the OR, OR of plastic surgery where they did injectables and then I finally felt really at home that I could put these two worlds together and that's sort of my story in a nutshell but really that's 15 years. So I started when I was 21 going to university and I'm now 36 so 15 years of getting to where I am. I opened up the cosmetic clinic five years ago after this sort of strong intuition that I'm going to go into medical aesthetics and I'm going to do it in a very different way where we really focus on the science so that people feel really comfortable that these are proven treatments and that everything that we offer is backed by science and backed by Health Canada and backed by safety and then we can really feel super comfortable in this medical space that's also cosmetics and put everything together and here I am three clinics later uh, we are three clinics and counting and we're clearly doing something really interesting because we're growing like crazy people really want this this idea of medical but cosmetic and they want to feel safe they want it to be kind of clinical but not too clinical and that's kind of where we are and we believe in natural results we believe in listening to our patients that um, you are the driver, you decide sort of how you feel about aging, and then we just sort of compliment you with what we can offer. And over the years, we've really grown our, our offerings based on feedback and obviously the science and what people are looking for, what people want, what are their biggest insecurities and what's out there that we can sort of meet you where you're at and provide you the best quality services in that arena, essentially. And so here we are, I'm the CEO of the cosmetic clinic and I, I'm a nurse and I inject a couple of days a week and I grow these beautiful relationships with these amazing people like Julie and some of them are so authentic and it really just fuels and drives me, which is why I want to do this because I love sharing knowledge and making people feel really comfortable with what we do. Do you have your master's in biology? I don't You're have my doing master's in biology. Well. I'm doing my master's now in nursing. The big game here is that there's a little bit of a gap in medicine and cosmetics and it comes to the sort of the standards and the regulations it's so new in Canada really within the last 20 years that our regulations haven't really caught up and I thought why don't I with my brain and thinking about standards and, and every how far I've come why don't I use that to be able to consult our governing bodies and be able to actually help with policy so that we can make medical aesthetics stronger in Canada and safer for our patients everywhere so we aren't seeing these crazy Crazy things on social media which will probably maybe get into a little bit of that but I really want to help in that aspect and I think that my expertise can do that but I felt like I needed more scholarly and academic credentials behind my name even though I know I already have tons mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I'm doing my master's I, I do believe I am the first in Canada who will be completing her master's in nursing through the lens of cosmetic medicine because it's not as exactly accepted as a specialty yet. And that's what I'm out to change. And so I'm on a journey to do that. But yeah, I'm, I'm doing my master's right now as well as all that other stuff. I love that I'm seeing you travel all over the world too. Like you're meeting everybody in the industry from where? Like Switzerland and New York and California and all these places. Every country must work a little bit differently, doesn't it? As far as rules and regulations or, or what they're allowed. And, and there might be people joining in from other countries countries as well that each country has a different set of regulations for what we do and in some countries the nurses don't even offer this and I think that's that's wrong because we do a really good job of it we just need the right knowledge and education but it really yeah. does
does vary country to country. It even varies province to province and it varies state to state. But how do I know and really become an expert at that without traveling the world? And how do I know what the greatest new implementations in cosmetic medicine are if I don't go out there and find it myself and hear it right from the horse's mouth, going to meet other experts and networking and really getting to the nitty gritty of what's coming. That's why travel, I I'm, I'm really want to go and find the best and sort of bring it back to Canada or bring it back and and trial it, determine if it's valid or if we do or don't like it. And you have a whole team of people and I can see from, well, I follow all of them too. And I can see them all traveling with you to so many locations for their training and always upgrading their training, which brings me on to my next kind of topics. The reason I asked Chelsea to be here with me tonight, and I think we're going to make this a series because we have so much to talk about. We can't be here forever. So we're going to do a series. We did discuss that last night. But one of the things that really made me want to have Chelsea on was because I saw a fellow friend of mine. She was talking about Morpheus 8 and radio frequency, microneedling, all of that. And she had a very negative experience with it. So her video was warning people never to do it. I, I don't know who did it, but obviously the person probably meant well, but maybe wasn't as educated as she should be. And so she had a bad experience with her radio frequency. And so a couple things, I want to set it straight of what radio frequency and microneedling is. Why can it go wrong? And, and how did I have such great results? Because the visuals of my results, I have a great before and after picture of my neck after Morpheus state treatments and the results are undeniable. I was very lucky to come across you when I did. What are the questions that people should ask to make sure that they're getting in with a an educated practitioner to do these treatments? Because I think that's the big problem is trusting that you're going to the right place and then having a negative result. How these things work is when you buy one of these devices, you're buying them from a credible retailer manufacturer and they have to be Health Canada approved. So in, in Canada, for example, uh, some of these devices do end up in the hands of people that it hasn't been regulated and they just use devices. So at least we know that with these devices, radio frequency like Morpheus 8 or Potenza, which are a couple of my loves, um, we know that they're Health Canada approved. So when they're Health Canada approved, they've got this, this backing behind them that says that they do, they're safe and that they do something that makes a difference for the receiver. So there's that. The second thing is that when we buy these devices, there is a training that comes with them. So it's a very basic training. They are usually within parameters that are very safe. You should know that anybody who has these should have proper training. So you can actually ask, have you been trained by the manufacturer themselves or by another expert in the field? So when it comes to nursing skills, we have to learn by specialty, so by accredited bodies, or we learn from other nurses, we can do that. And then we also can get advanced training. And then there's also this intuitive part where you just kind of know that the person is knows what they're talking about. Because once you learn the physics behind these devices, then you learn how they work, how they function, what your limitations are, what the safety limitations are, how you can manipulate them a little bit. But it really does take the effort to understand how these devices work. and learn to work with them and play within them. But there's a little bit of an intuition. I feel like you do need with that provider. You need to build a rapport. And I think Google reviews are an, another great thing or social media. People will blast their poor results for the most part. And of course, there are some things that, that can happen um, that are haphazard or one in a million. Uh, of course, there's always risks when it comes to this. But you know, if they have a device that's approved by the country's governing bodies, if they got it from the right sources, and they should have had proper manufacturer training to keep people safe. One thing I find is that when you're starting to use something, you start to feel a little bit invincible. You might go rogue. And unless you continue to look at your education and your training to remind yourself what the parameters are for these things, people might be using them in ways that they shouldn't be using them. So I think it's a lot about the device itself, but mm -hmm. a, a lot more about the practitioner behind it. And that, that takes rapport building and the business itself, yeah. if, it's, if it's credible, then uh, I think you can feel good about going forward. But don't be afraid to ask if that person has certification. So when we get that training from the manufacturer, it costs a lot of money to get th that training and the devices are really expensive. We actually get certificates. Now it's hard, we have so many staff, we can't plaster them across the wall, but everyone has one that are operating yeah. with these devices. It's kind of like hair 
hairstyling. Like I can go through to be a hairstylist, but I won't know the latest and greatest techniques unless I continue on my, with my training. And that, that's how the good ones get great is with the proper training and the continued education, right? So I actually have a lot of compliments. Like, what do you do for your neck? There are a couple of things that we do, Chelsea and I, um, for my neck. But the biggest thing that I saw, well, two, there's two things. One recently was the Botox, but the Morpheus 8, I've had three in the one year, one month after another, right, consecutively. And then a year later, I did another one, which would be my fourth, which would be my upkeep. What does radio frequency do? So what is radio frequency? It is a, basically an energy. We have different types of energies they have different wavelengths and we have different uses for them and different limitations but in the in terms of radio frequency actually just think about it as a wavelength of energy that it can be applied to the skin and inside the skin the skin responds in a certain way by sometimes it's stretching the fibroblast which make collagen there there's different responses but i'll go back in history a little bit before we had radio frequency microneedling there were Microneedling devices, which is essentially the a needle penetration really, really quickly into the skin to cause a trauma. Basically, it's a fake trauma. It makes the body think that there's a trauma and it needs to respond by healing, but there's no true trauma there. And so you get the effects of healing without there being any damage. So that's one type of technology. And then we have radio frequency, which was originally designed to be applied just on top of the skin. And it basically turns into heat once transferred into this into the skin. So there is a limitation there that the, you, the, the higher we heat it, the more response we get inside the skin, but to a certain point because you can burn the skin. So there's a little happy medium between like 40 and 44 degrees that we heat the skin up with radio frequency topical. Then there was this crazy invention where they said, what if we put radio frequency and microneedling in the same device, we'll use the needles to bypass the skin so there's no burning of the skin, and we get some of that energy delivered into the deeper layers, is there a better effect? And it turns out there is absolutely a better effect and we have more manipulation and control once we get past the skin. And that's what it is. The needles go in, they're insulated, and so this energy can be driven through the insulated needle and have the effects underneath. And the effects underneath range from creating little coagulations that are essentially little points of skin tightening, and then we end up with hundreds of thousands of them. And also the heat that will stimulate fibroblasts to make collagen. And that obviously thickens up our skin and gives us this bounciness. So we kind of have a two in one. And how you use that is depends how the tissue underneath um, responds. So if you go too light, you're not going to get a response. If you go too heavy, you can end up with a little bit of damage. And so there's a happy medium in between. And that's what radio frequency is. It's an energy. And then the microneedling put together, it's a vehicle to get the radio frequency underneath the skin or into the skin, depending on which mode you're using to have an effect of anti-aging that we are all loving. I love these techniques and these devices that keep me looking like me. What I love about the microneedling and the radio frequency is that it's a skin tightening, but this is something that happens over time. It doesn't change anything about my face other than it just makes my skin better. If you're looking for a, wow, that looks really good. It's not going to happen. It takes time. Tracy was just asking if you recommend microneedling over microdermabrasion. They're very different. So microdermabrasion is really just an, ex it's an exfoliation. And there's hope that through that mechanical exfoliation that there's the response that new skin grows um, and that there might be some collagen but I wouldn't say it's as impactful if you're looking for that collagen growth or skin tightening. Microdermabrasion is really good for polishing off that dead skin. So they kind of do something very different. So I'd say it more depends on what your goal is of those treatments matched your goal better. Callie's asking, uh, do you do any fat transfer from body, belly, under eye, or are there any cutting edge treatments to address under eye tear troughs? So I had mentioned to you last night, Chelsea, that that's a lot of what people are asking about is the under eye. So good question. As we talked about earlier, I'm always on top of what services could or might be coming. So I'll tell you a little story that a couple of years ago, I kind of had a feeling that fat transfer was really going to become a thing in more of my field. So it's been a thing for a long time in plastic surgery. People are under anesthetic and they, you know, have lip liposuction removed. But then there was also this transfer of fat done under uh, general anesthesia. 
Then there was this company that created a system to be able to take the fat and do different things with it, not under anesthesia, but under local. And I thought, oh, this is going to be something really interesting. And so why don't I go travel the world and find where they're doing this the best and bring it back? So I did train on this a couple of years ago in Beverly Hills at um, the Beverly Hills Aesthetic Institute with a very world famous plastic surgeon, got that training and came back and still waiting for Health Canada to approve this. And it, it's not yet. So um, I don't do it. I think it's very interesting. There's a lot of safety considerations to have in a, in, in a clinic for something like that. And then also because I'm so science based, what is it doing and what are like, let's let other people sort of let other countries make these mistakes before we bring them on. And there, there's a little bit of controversy with it, with the success rate of the fat. How much do you take it and, and manipulate it? How much can you manipulate it before it's not usable anymore or dies? Because we do know some fat dies. So I don't do it, but I did receive training and it's something that i would entertain but i don't do it because it's not health canada approved and we just don't do anything that isn't backed uh, by health so canada you got your eye on it i got my eye on it a long time ago years yeah. ago <laughs> i remember you doing that training i didn't know what it was but i remember you going out there kelly has a couple of questions how do you feel about microcurrent at home devices do you feel that they're effective i think the jury's still out on that but what i do know is that we aren't seeing and a lot of negative effects I don't know how powerful they are and haven't seen a lot of studies that are extremely convincing because I'm after pretty strong results. So like that topical uh, radio frequency I was talking about before, I wasn't super impressed with that. I had my own treatments with it like long time ago. I wasn't in love with the, the percentage of success. If it's not going to be a wow factor, I try not to bring it on. So the jury is just sort of out on that, but I haven't seen it be unsafe. There's no issues with it, but more science to come and I'll be a little bit more convinced. I feel it's probably one of those things that it's not going to hurt. It, it's getting the blood circulation and the and the lymphatic drainage and bringing blood to the surface. And, and people just don't have the money sometimes, right, to go in to get the, the big services. So that's something that you can do. It's not going to hurt you as, as far as, like you said, there's nothing safety, exactly. safety wise going on. So I would say that there's some devices that are crazy expensive. And I don't know that there's any significant difference between the crazy expensive ones and the lesser expensive ones. So mm -hmm. if I can give any guidance on that, it would be sure, go ahead, no yeah. problem. Problem. There could definitely be some benefits with it. Don't spend a lot of money on that. Yeah. And then the other question here Kelly has is, I don't know how to say that four dice bumps and other types of bumps. I saw a very conservative and experienced derm, but still get those uh, bumps with lip filler. There's probably different types. There's some that you can get just from the, the lidocaine itself, which is short term. You, I see that a lot where we get these little white bumps all over and it lasts you know, the day. So filler in general has a whole science behind it. And there's some that belong in the lips and some that don't. And there are ways to manipulate it. I do believe in massage heavily. You must massage your after treatment to get any of that is cohesive. So it kind of wants to stick together. But there's there's stretchy properties, there's sticky properties, there's um, firm properties that it can hold a lot of pressure and come back together. And because of that, you wouldn't want something that was too firm or clumpy. There are some that are worse than others. And sometimes it's just about picking the right type and doing a good massage and sometimes it just clumps up no matter what and so there are ways that you can go and break it down safely it's always going to be an issue i think with hyaluronic acid fillers so it's to expertise of the type of filler i would say could it be just the person and the way their body handles handles there it or? is that i what i do see uh, enough fair enough is that not everybody is symmetrical or symmetrical in the way that they move their mouth or the muscle surrounding their mouth so if somebody has paralysis on one side, they're going to heavily use the muscles on the other side. And that movement can coerce filler that's been deposited in there into a certain area mm. or manipulate it to clump together. And it, so that does play a role. Those are things that are kind of beyond our control. And if you were to constantly massage it every day, you could very well move it into a different area. And that's kind of what talking does it moves the mm -hmm. moves your lips and the tissues kind of move and coerce the filler with it so that is possible what i recommend for those is to have multiple sessions 
So I've had it where that person just then just in one spot, it doesn't want to stay and it wants to keep moving. And the more persistent you are, you kind of come back, you do a little detail and another little detail until eventually it's sort of happy and it's full and it doesn't have a lot more room to move. That's an option. It's not a perfect science, to be honest, but we have yeah. good techniques to help. I always said that about you is that you have an artistic eye. So I, I really think like I have been to other injectors before I've been getting Botox since I was 30 years old. So I've visited many people before Chelsea, even when I look at you, your makeup, you, you've got an artistic eye and not every injector does. I think that that's really important. So I kind of say to people, interview your injector. Don't just go in. You have to really feel good about what they're saying. That's what I would look for. If something happened that you moved away and I had to go to somebody else, that's what I would look for is to have somebody with that same artistic eye. I find that you're always honest with me that it may not like, we're going to see if this works kind of thing. And yeah. that that's wonderful because it's like anything. It's not exact everybody's body is different. It can handle it in different ways. I think no matter how experienced you are, there's always room for error. And so anybody that promises you the world or it's going to be perfect or like it, it doesn't have any reservation or doesn't consult you or talk to you about those things, I, you know, you gotta, you gotta question that. A good injector will know their limitations and tell you this is what we can do, but this could also be the outcome. And, and then you get to decide for yourself, at least you yeah. know that there's limitations. It's not a perfect science. Artistic eye is really important. If your injector or even your physician or anybody that is working with you doesn't look normal or looks overdone, like I get this comment all the time, how would they feel coming to me? If I did not look natural, it would be a flag. However, there are a lot of people who look really unnatural and even people who look kind of strange in my industry and, and mm -hmm. people who go to them. So there's like this critical, how much do you trust that? And I feel like the, the walk, the walk is stronger than the talk, the talk. You can tell that they have artistry if their own face looks sort of human-like. Yeah. And that's the beauty, I think, of a lot of the injectors in our clinics. They have this zest for makeup, for beauty, mm -hmm. for some of us are creative, we paint. And there's just like this artistic part of you that that comes out in, in the injection world. And then you look at a female and their rules, in my opinion, it's not just about like, obviously there's safety, but you ought to know that there, the female generally loves the arching of the eyebrow and they don't love the arching of the eyebrow to look like this. They more love the arching of the eyebrow to look like this, or they really appreciate the feminine dynamics of the mid face into the cheek. You know, you can really obscure that quickly by putting it in the wrong spot. So it's about using the skull. So you analyze and then you use your artistic ability to build upon it to restore something usually. And if you're trying mm -hmm. to change something, people don't tend to love that. And that's that fine line, that artistic eye. I totally agree with you that that's something you should look for in an injector. You posted something over on Instagram. If you want to follow Nurse Chelsea over on Instagram, she's under Nurse Chelsea and she has the cosmetic clinic as well. I think you actually did like a green screen where the woman came in with issues around her eyes. She was quite unhappy with this area. When you were talking, you mentioned that it's because she had lost volume in her cheeks. And you've mentioned more than once that really you have to look at what's around it and you have to start filling from the top down. Another question, and this will tie into it a little bit. There were problems with this area here that I was just talking to somebody about the other day. And it again, got me thinking about the cheeks, that it's not a filler here, that it's the cheeks. So that's really important, I think. So when we're looking at this area here, because I think this is a lot of what people are questioning or wondering about, there are a few things that you can do and come to play, right? So we no longer treat in isolation. So if somebody comes in and they say, oh, I want this filled, it's not about filling this. It's about looking at the whole landscape and what's contributing to that because half the time it actually has nothing to do with what they're looking at what they're looking at is a symptom of a cascade of events of aging so if somebody comes in and they say i've got tear trough or something i'm not liking here or there's something I'm not liking down here, I go laser focus to the center of it. There's anatomy behind that, that how we age is how we should fill or inject in the same sequence. And that's actually the secret to doing natural injections. Mm -hmm. But a long time ago, people would come in and they would, I mean, actually, no, that still happens. There's still a ton of injectors out there doing it piecemeal. I see this fold, I want this fold filled until you fill all the crevices and then something still doesn't look right and you look 
pie face or too plump, we got to look at the, the structures that are causing the issue. Now the tear trough in the under eye area can be losing fat and losing volume, but it's not the first area that most people lose volume in. It's usually in the center of the face. You just do the proper things first. You'll have a bigger impact with less pharmaceuticals or less medical device. And then you move from there. It's just about looking at the face as a holistic entity. Mm -hmm. And that's where I go first because the tear trough has uh, support in the mid face. And just remember that there's so many different layers of tissue that age. Well, the first thing that we tend to do is look at the wrinkles and lines of our upper face and the muscles are heavily responsible for that. So that's one tissue layer. But then each tissue layer as you get older starts to thin out or sag. And so we're talking now down into the fat and then down into the bone and those all have changes. So if you keep using the same treatment for different symptoms of aging, you're not going to get a really nice result. So we tend to often treat here first and then move up or down. It makes sense because if you're losing volume here, this starts pulling, right? Two things. One, those fat pads are shrinking. Our body is in constant mode of rejuvenation. Every single cell, we get new ones over a lifespan. Some renew really quickly. Skin is one of those. Every 40 to 60 days, we got a whole new, whole thickness of skin. Our body is constantly breaking down those fat cells, but always replacing it. Same with collagen, mm -hmm. with bone, until eventually our body stops replacing it at the same rate that it's breaking it down. And then before you know it, those beautiful fat pads that were nice and full and nice cheek, the ones that your anti pinches, um, before you know it, those fat pads have shrunken. And then they start to sort of separate and descend because they don't have all the other structures around them either that at 100% capacity. It's that movement that we're trying to replace and replicate. Is there a gold standard for lip filler that you would recommend? There's soft products that have high stretch or have high cohesivity. And I like the ones that are soft. They eventually get softer. I like the ones that have really good stretch value, but return to their natural shape. So if they keep, if you stretch and it stays stretched well then you don't have the structure in the lips and that's often what people are going for but something that would go in the cheek to give you that nice lifting that and and has firmness to it would not be something i would put in the lips once you understand the properties of it you, you could almost use almost any filler as long as it wasn't super uh, thick or firm I do have my favorites, but each injector, I would say, also has their favorites. I won't say brand names, no. uh, but, but something soft, but that holds structure. And then the lip type, the lip shape, the lip age, the lip volume loss also dictates that approach. Sometimes if you have really thin lips, you have to use something really safe because you, you're, it's really difficult to change the, the, the shape of the outside and you might have to do it in a lot of stages and you might use a different product at each stage depending on how the skin or how the tissue is accepting that, that dermal filler. So I'm sorry that's not a clear cut answer, but I think it's about seeing their before and after photos and know mm -hmm. okay, they know what they're doing. And if you see your own type of lips in their before and after photos, uh, you know, you know that they can do what mm -hmm. you need to do. Kelly is asking, what's the preference between Dysport and Botox? I have different preferences for different uses. We have all of the brands and they're all the same price. We don't want people to choose one over the other based on price. We want to choose what's correct. Now, at the end of the day, it's neuromodulation and they all perform the same. Like they're all, they all go onto the receptor, blocks the acetylcholine, which disallows the muscle to move. However, there might be different reasons for different ones. I actually like both of those. I would say that we use Dysport, definitely use Dysport with higher frequency than other brands. That comes from personal preference, to be honest. Uh, that's just the, if an injector uses what they love, then they get really, really good with it. I would say I use Dysport more, but there's reasons, other reasons why we might not use it and we then there's botox reasons. here exactly there's reasons why we might use botox brand this comes down to sometimes din number there's some medical treatments that we have that we might need one brand over the other because it's insurance based but essentially i can get the same result with any neuromodulator i just have preferences kelly says enjoying this so much oh, oh and kelly you. says very interesting the whole face anatomy consideration so enlightening thanks nurse chelsea and julie yeah. you even mentioned when we were talking about lips how the lip gets longer, but also you mentioned that the structure underneath actually starts shrinking. 
the maxilla bone that holds our top teeth essentially and our mandible bone that holds our bottom teeth and our orbital bone around our eye that actually undergoes a lot of change and it goes back to that breaking down and replacement during our metabolism of our life that eventually the bone will be reabsorbed and not put back the same way and we tend to see it in this area a lot and the example that i use is kind of an unfair i mean it's a real example but if you think of the most elderly woman that you know or have ever met there's a lot of falling in at the lip area and in the mouth that sometimes they speak and you actually can't even see their teeth. Mm -hmm. And that's because the bones have retruded, sort of regressed and are smaller, but the skin stays the same and kind of hangs over. So again, you can't use one mode. You can't just use one type of treatment. You have to use a combination of different modalities to replace volume or work in the muscle or tighten the skin. You have to work in all the different layers. There's no one solution. You kind of need a little mm -hmm. bit of all, but that's actually what what you're really good at, Julie. You're good at like working with different, you're tr with that trust that you're like, you know what, I'm going to try this and I'm going to try this. And at the yeah. end, you actually look very natural and you've tried a lot of different things. Yeah, because we're attacking everything from different angles. We've got the first thing that I, I went to see Nurse Chelsea was the temple fillers because I could see that this was going in. And one thing that happens when this starts to sink in is this starts to drop as well, right? When you fill this back to the way it once was, and it's not changing your features necessarily, it's just bringing back what you had, right? People aren't really thinking of it that way, but when you understand, like Chelsea said, the anatomy of everything, it's those little tweaks that nobody really can tell that you've done anything at all. Because you're just restoring what you used to look like, which brings yeah. the most happiness to people. And it's the science of aging, the science of gerontology. We know that there is a certain age in everybody's life that they recognize themselves best with. And it's typically on average around the age of 40. There was a bunch of studies done, surveys done on elderly women asking you know, you look in the mirror and how old do you feel that you should look like? And they usually were, a lot of people were saying 40, but you look in the mirror and you don't look 40. So there's this dissonance. And when you can restore somebody to even a little bit looking more like their ideal age that they felt in their life, they looked good or felt good. That's really empowering for them. Mm -hmm. So it's not about augmenting you in a way that makes you look different. It's actually about replenishing how you used to look. And that's the key. And you mentioned it. This is the wholeness. I've actually got quite a bit of Halloween going on. I've been doing a, a biostimulatory treatment and actually has been working better on this side and I need another session on this side. The shape of the face in youth is actually an upside down triangle. So you're actually larger at the top. Your bone and structure kind of come in narrowly for a, this feminine sort of, it's actually an upside down triangle, but some people might look at it as heart shape. And then eventually when things start falling, then it becomes the opposite. So it hollows mm -hmm. out up here, we get jowls down here and the triangle actually tends to invert. And so everything that we do is actually just trying to flip that triangle back. And temples are a game changer because it doesn't, people don't look at you and say, like you said, look at you and say, oh, you had yeah. temple filler done. It's just, there's something about you that your face looks youthful. And, and it's that je ne sais quoi, I don't know what it is, but she looks great. And those are the features we're after. Those are That's the exactly it. Yeah. And then Sarah's asking about CO2 laser. Do you recommend CO2 laser for someone with fair sensitive skin? I have heard of side effects. Oh, and heart palpitations. Oh, and thoughts on all therapy all therapy. So a couple questions there. CO2 laser is actually best only for fair skin. Um, so there, it is a, a little bit of a non-inclusive treatment, if you will. We, we have a lot of lasers that can be used on all skin types. However, CO2 is, that's a little bit of, there might be, there's different settings, but when you're doing those really deep peels, we're kind of more looking at, at fair skin. Sensitive skin, sensitive is a very subjective word. And I have very reactive skin, but I wouldn't say I have sensitive skin. So I do a treatment like a chemical peel or something. And I can actually, my skin looks kind of crazy, but it's just very reactive. I don't really know that it's going on and it settles down quite nicely. So it, I think it depends on the sensitivity. If it, you were finding it sensitive because you had some type of chronic condition like acne or rosacea, those would be considerations for um, maybe postponing these treatments until we had that under control. So I think fair skin, yes. Sensitive, question mark, we would require a consultation with the mm -hmm. provider. Side effects of scarring and heart palpitations. Scarring is always possible. Any device, because we're using ablative or heat and heat can really impact skin. It can cause burns. It depends on what the source or what the 
the energy is trying to go to. So if it's a pigmentation device and that person has a lot of pigmentation, like they have very melanated skin, it requires a different approach because most of these machines don't know how to determine this pigment that you're trying to get rid of from this pigment mm -hmm. and it can end up burning. But that's not what CO2 does. It doesn't attack pigment. Scarring is always possible. Again, a consultation would be required to know if you were a candidate for it and which settings do you really want to do a deep ablation or do you want to do something more surface? And heart palpitations, I would not say that the CO2 has anything to do with that, but oftentimes, I'm not going to lie, CO2 is not com a comfortable treatment. Like high stress yeah. response. But what we do for those patients is numb or use lidocaine and, and inject so that you don't feel anything. It's actually that that has the cardiovascular response. It's not a bad thing. It's okay. It's very momentary, but it, it can cause more palpitations in some people than others. So you might have a sensitivity to lidocaine. But again, it's not because of the treatment. It's because of the comfort measures that we're using alongside it. And some people are really sensitive to lidocaine or um, analgesics of the like. Thoughts on all therapy. We do not offer all therapy. Again, so that's a brand name. This is, it's a different type of energy. And again, Again, it's applied topically. I'm the type that likes the energy to go in and through the skin. So mm -hmm. there's been many iterations throughout the evolution of these devices, and they tended to be topical before. And I also believe in multiple treatments when all therapy it's done once. So I don't want to knock it because I don't offer it. Some people have had great results on all therapy. I've had a lot of patients report that, but that's not kind of the avenue that that we want to go. Right. You know? Uh, Kelly's asking, I am curious what your first choice in office treatment for melasma hyperpigmentation. PicoSure Pro, which is a type of laser that doesn't produce heat. So there's a, a couple of different types of options for hyperpigmentation. But if melasma is the key or is the one thing that you do have, then you need to be really careful with heat. Heat can make melasma worse. Mm -hmm. So there are devices that the energy goes in and doesn't transfer to heat. Those are our PicoSure products, our PicoSecond technologies, where the packet of energy is so fast into that skin and attacking that chromophore, that brown pigment, that it doesn't even have a chance to turn into heat. So it blasts it without turning into heat at all. And that's why we need that treatment for melasma because it doesn't turn into heat. Big difference there. And I like the PicoSecond technology because I have that safety and also because I can use it on all skin types. IPL is also another option, but not great for deeper skin tones. Fitzpatrick is how the word that we use to determine different skin tones. And the deeper, more melanated ones don't do well with the IPL because again, it's attacking those chromophores with heat. And I've seen it online, social media, dark skin tones turn up with burnt patches and squares on their faces from improper use of IPL it has no belonging with the deeper skin tones. There are some technicians that can manipulate the settings in certain ways. IPL can have different wavelengths. So I should say that, but it is, it can be easily misused, okay. but melasma picosecond technology only and topicals that can help melasma as well. It's a, always a, something you're going to be dealing with. It doesn't go away. I have melasma. You wouldn't know. I have a lot of access to treatments, but I, a picosecond technology only for somebody who has mm -hmm. melasma. I had Potenza and the PicoSure mixed together. Wow. So when you do the blend of the two devices, are you able to go as strong with the PicoSure as you normally would if you used it alone? It depends. I look at the person and I look at their pigmentation. And if it looks really surface level, there actually is no need to be super aggressive with it. And actually there's a graduated approach. You don't just go in guns a blazing. There's a reason why we do multiple treatments. We need to get that pigment from top layer down to bottom layers. So if I look at them and they have really superficial sort of light pigmentation, then that's going to be totally sufficient to do a little bit of a lighter, lighter treatment with a radio frequency microneedling on top and can give you the same results. So more and harder and more aggressive is not always more, is not, doesn't always yield better results. It takes looking at the skin and what, what it looks like. And sometimes we split them up. So if we look at the person, we do want to do a more aggressive treatment, then we might need to separate those out. So when you mix those two together, you get superficial collagen and deep collagen and the reduction of pigmentation and the microcoagulations for skin tightening. It's a really a beautiful recipe. Mm -hmm. Nice, beautiful skin.
With all of these treatments, except for filler, with the radiofrequency, the microneedling, Sculptra, I don't know if there's anything else, it's, and correct me if I'm wrong, where you're trying to teach the body to fix itself, to yeah. create more collagen, to build more collagen. And from what I understand, Sculptra, or I'm not sure what the actual other name for it would be, but that's something that is similar. Is that correct? Yes, they just do in yeah. different ways. It's called PLLA, polylactic acid. And again, it's so our, we have genetic material and we've got these little structures inside our skin that have a function. We're humans and we're really good at figuring out how to manipulate things. And so that's what we're doing. We're going, okay, these fibroblasts, which make collagen are getting really lazy and these little, they're factories and they're slowing production as we age. For some reason, things slow down and we have all of these different modalities that send a message. So radio frequency microneedling, um, PLLA or Sculptra or other biostimulants, even PRP, so your own natural platelets, all have a different messaging sort of system to go and tell those little factories to just crank it up. And the more you crank it up, the, the nicer and rejuvenated your skin is going to look. So they all do that. They just do it in different ways mm -hmm. and they have different end products because there's actually a lot of different types of collagen. Collagen type one is the one we're really after. That's the one that gives us that bounce to our skin, but there's actually like 20 some different types of collagen. And then there's also elastin. It's all about these structures in between the skin cells or in between the cells and the fibroblasts. It's called the ECM. And and it's in that little area that we want all this elastin and collagen. And that's what gives us this density back. The more you do, the different types of sort of collagen and the different ways they're laid all together to me gives a nicer result when you use multiple. I started getting a visual of your um, process for the PicoSure. So you do it in sessions because, is that because the lower layers are starting to kind of come back up to the surface? And Yes and no. It comes from a melanocyte. And those melanocytes are creating pigmentation in the deeper layers. And then it, it, that's exactly it. It starts to release melanin and each skin cell has that melanin in it until it reaches the skin surface. So all those little melanocytes are starting to kind of go haywire and they're not listening anymore and they're being produced when they don't need to be. They are in layers aside from melasma because that melasma is doing something a little bit different that we don't want it to do. It's finding, it's actually, instead of going up, it's actually going down and it's really hard to, to go in and, and grab okay. the melanin down there. It's almost like shaving it off a little bit. That's the best approach. The best way is to just get the superficial layers down to the deeper layers. And then hopefully in the meantime, you're really shutting off the producers of melanin with a skin cream or something. So those devices will also get rid of tattoos. Uh, the picosecond technology is the safest yeah. for tattoos and it's the same idea. Pigment is deposited in the skin in different layers and you got to do this approach where you take it layer by layer. If you try to get the deeper layers first, you're bypassing those top layers and you need it all gone. Um, Tracy had mentioned her friend had or somebody had Fraxel and she saw her and she didn't notice a difference. Is that one of those things again that it helps over time? So like a Morpheus 8 where I got my treatment, but nobody would have known. It's such a gradual treatment that yeah. six months down the road, I'm look at the four, before and after pictures and I'm like, holy cow. So is that the same with fractional laser? We don't offer that. So harder for me to speak on, to be honest, but all devices are the same in the way that they require, it's a graduated approach because they're manipulating the tissue to some degree, some more than others. And, and so you have to wait for the response. That's, that is actually how lasers work. Lasers are not immediate, like the way that we want them to be. Uh, dermal fillers are immediate aside from the swelling and things, but different devices have different levels of result. but it's always a graduated approach. It's very yeah. like, even, even those treatments like a therapy that are a one and done, it's not like the next morning you have it, uh, your yeah. result. It is, you have to wait for the skin to, to get the cues, to get the message from whatever's being delivered. As far as downtime goes for these types of treatments, I actually watched somebody yesterday. I can't remember who it was on a video and said, some people's idea of downtime is different than other people's idea of downtime. Like there's bruising, of course, that could be downtime that might, if you're not embarrassed about that, that might be considered downtime. That also goes with that evolution of these devices and treatments that not only have they been working on them being more effective, they've been working on them having less downtime. That was a really big trend in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. 
people just didn't want the downtime. There are some, it's like plastic surgery. You're not going to get the result without some of the downtime. Downtime is different for everybody. So you've got to find out what downtime means to somebody. So for example, for radio frequency microneedling or Pico shirt, I can bounce back quite quickly. As a matter of fact, the next day they often make my skin look glowy because of the response of the skin, uh, bringing all these beautiful things to the surface. So you can actually have a really nice look to the skin, even while it's still healing. So that might be downtime. Other people being out of the sun might be downtime to other people, not being able to use their retinol for a few days could be downtime Mm -hmm. and other people who their maximum, like their downtime is if there's a bruise. So I I think everybody's definition of downtime is different, but I would say for the most part, most treatments are, are great for downtime. And we have all little tips and tricks for how to get along with them a lot better. So even if you've got some redness or bruising underneath, if you can wear makeup, that's not really downtime because you can hide it. It really is person dependent Mm -hmm. and your, your provider should be asking you what downtime means. And then there's some people who are proud. Hey, I got this treatment. (laughs) I, I just go on everywhere. Like I just go on and show everybody. I did bruise quite badly with the sculpt drop. I made a video out of it and showed how to cover it up with makeup. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, again, that's a fact. And we're using like a needle and cannula when we're doing Sculptra. And so both of those have their own uh, risks for downtime. And as long as you plan well, it's it should be mm-hmm. just fine to get along with. One of my favorite treatments that Chelsea did, the Botox. I've been doing that for a long time, by the way. And we were doing, what do you call it? The patismal Patismal bands? bands, yeah people don't realize that those muscles are actually pulling your skin down. And that makes a huge difference with the smoothness of my neck. You got to imagine that neuromodulators, they will make a muscle basically oppose its natural movement. So like the forehead, the ones that means you raise up, you're not actually able to raise up as much, which is not a bad thing if you use neuromodulators early on. But for example, the neck, so it wants to kind of pull down and it actually is attached. There's muscles in here that are sort of attached and woven in. All they want to do is kind of pull down and sag over time and they end up sort of getting stronger. And then there's other things that happen too. The skin loses collagen. But if you put some neuromodulators in there, this the, the muscle wants to release what it's naturally doing and do the opposite. So instead of pulling down, you want mm. it to step back up. We do that here yep. on me and we do my neck. I have very strong muscles here and they want to pull down. Yep. And that makes me look sad and I don't like that. So I'm just gonna say the techniques are always changing. So we've actually got better and better techniques for how to inject that properly. You need to be always evolving. And then also know that new techniques aren't always great. You got to try it to figure out if it works or not. But we think we've got a really good yeah. system for you. So Tracy is saying, how often do you do microneedling? So I love, again, those treatments where you're going to trick the skin, trick the DNA into doing what you want to do, trick it into producing more collagen than it has been. Collagen growth has a a cascade of events to get to the, I call it the collagen bloom. So you kind of want to push the DNA, push the fibroblasts towards making more. Then it gets sort of comfortable and then you do it again. And then it does it and then it starts to get comfortable and then you hit it again. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, this factory has had major stimulation and now it's going to produce tons of collagen. We call it collagen banking where you create all this collagen and it sits there and it takes a long time for your body to take that collagen away. Really like to get a high level of collagen bloom happening. And then when we're happy with the collagen bloom, you can kind of hold off a little bit, but multiple treatments will be important. So if you're just starting out, you definitely need to do a regimen of at least three of regular microneedling, radio frequency microneedling, pigmentation. You need to, you need to do multiple of them to yield high results. Anybody who says you're going to do one treatment, it's going to look amazing. Again, watch these promises, just beware. So you do a few and then you let everything do the work. And then at a certain point, usually six months to a year later, then we do it again. You may not have to follow that protocol all over again, but to do a one maintenance treatment to remind those little fibroblasts, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be making all this collagen Mm -hmm. and get them to stimulate it again. So that's kind of how it works. It's usually a four week process for a lot of things. One month, 30 days, four to six weeks, depends on what the goal is, but it's usually that type of regimen once a month for a few times and then let it do its work. And then you revisit it later when you think you need a boost. Do you have a favorite treatment? That's a really tough question. I would say it comes from the, like these, these moments that we create first timers for neuromodulators when they realize what it can do. It's a really cool Mm -hmm. thing to like, it's that control back that people get. That's Um, one thing that will never get old for me. And then aside from that is, is actually the mid face rejuvenation 
provides a very strong response uh, when done right. People cry, people like, I did not, I never saw that. How did you see that in me? And it's, and it's those moments. That's it for me. But I would say mid face rejuvenation. And then I'm also very much obsessed with radio frequency microneedling mm -hmm. because I just see the impact in my own skin and the manipulation that we can do. If, I, if there's something I don't like, most of the things can be resolved with uh, radio frequency microneedling when used correctly. I can just feel that actually, because yeah. that was what it was like when I would do somebody's makeup or somebody's hair, that feeling of them looking at themselves in the mirror and going, <gasps> you know, that they would walk taller, they would stand taller, they would, they wouldn't hide so much. And um, yeah, I think that that's a gift that you give people. So I don't judge people who tell me that I shouldn't do these things. It really is about the individual and what makes them feel good. To some people, it might be this, to other people, it might be gardening, to other people, it might be, you know, a totally, for my husband, it's his cars. Like for me, and, and I mentioned this even with Dr. Lacey, there's a lot of things that I can't control about my body. And to just do these little things that make me feel good when I look in the mirror. It's to make myself look as fresh as I can at this age, at 52 years old. It does give me some control. And I'm so grateful that these things are available to me because it's like having a good hairstyle. It's like coloring your hair. It's like dressing up in a beautiful outfit that makes you feel good. It really is no different than that. Everybody has their thing that makes them feel good. Maybe some funky jewelry. It is the same thing. It's a form of expression and it doesn't have to look like everybody else. It actually just has to make you feel good. And I think it's the same. If this makes you feel good, great. If it doesn't make you feel good, don't do it. Try to understand that you don't know everybody's reasons and just accept that they are being their individual self, just as you are being your individual self and just support women. Like, I think that's another thing what I love so much about you, Chelsea, is you just support women and, and men, but you're a big advocate for women. And people don't know this, but you train nurses. Like you just are this person that understands that there is room for everybody and it's not a competition. And that gift that you give people to help them feel good you know, I think that's really wonderful. And, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. It, obviously my life's work and I really enjoy it. And like I said, it's those moments where you can reach somebody and yeah. judgment often comes from a place of anger or fear um, or inferiority mm -hmm. or self-esteem or just something that people are projecting. At the end of the day, if we could all just support each other, it doesn't matter yeah. what it is, the world would be more beautiful and such and a better place. Seriously, support people to just do their own thing. Get your head out of what they're doing and let them lead mm -hmm. their own light and and yes. and let and then in return, everybody let you lead your own light too. So I yeah. agree. The judgment part needs to um be gone and it's okay if it's not for everybody. That's actually beautiful. Yeah. Differences are what make us a diverse world. Thank you so much for being here. I am going to sign off here now, let Chelsea go. She's had a full day at the clinic and she was so kind to join us here tonight. And we will get together again at some point. Again, if you have any specific questions that you want to get answered, let us know. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and um, share this, share this with all your friends. That would be great. I think everybody could benefit from this video that we did and we'll see you later. Bye Thank guys. Thank you everyone for, for having me Bye. in your community. Bye. <laughs> Bye.